Hi, my name is Martha Manriquez. I'm the coordinator in the Graduate Student Center. And um, thank you for attending today's workshop. I just want to introduce our Graduate Student Center staff. Uh, we have with us Dr. Luis Vega, who will be the moderator of this workshop. We have Adrian Silva, who is our uh, graduate uh, advisor, outreach coordinator, uh, advisor. And we have our student assistant, Jay Chayam Dasani, who works here in the Graduate Student Center. Thank you for being here today. And you can take it from here, Dr. Vega. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I like to uh, uh, tell you that there will be more workshops coming our way, especially we will be conducting uh, a research competition called the Grad Slam competition, three minute presentations. So if you're doing research with a professor and would like to present at that competition, please talk to us. If you go to our website too, we're gonna to put the link in the chat. You will see other workshops. We're inviting a celebrity here in town who is a reporter. We'll talk about how to get reaction from your speeches, she even sings on TV. So I hope you're able to come to that presentation. We have other person next week, we have a presentation on how to apply for scholarships. If you wanna be a professor there, you may have gotten a message from the university administrator about the Sally Casanova and the CVIP, the Chancellor's Doctoral Incentive Program. So I hope you can make those workshops at three o'clock uh, every Friday, maybe every other Friday we'll be having something. So please, uh, uh, I think Marta will put the Graduate Student Center link and uh, you can check other workshops. But today we're very fortunate that we have gathered a group of uh, professors who have taken time from their busy schedule and I'm very grateful again for your willingness to come and talk to us, to give us an overview of what research is like in their field and the different schools here on campus I'm a psychologist and I can tell you that psychology has such a wide range of um, experiences and research from observation, looking at children's development to working with rats in the lab to even the uh, brain, you know, even looking into the brain. But um, uh, we wanted to give you a snapshot of the research uh, process and our speakers today will present a little bit of what are the expectations, how is it that when they supervise research or their own research They'll give us a little insight on uh, how they answer research questions in their field. So we have four professors, um, each representing each of the schools here on campus from business, from arts and humanities, and I'll introduce them one at a time as they present um, social sciences and education and natural sciences and mathematics and engineering. So without further ado, uh, let me give them most of the time so that they can uh, uh, it's pretty free format. Uh, if you have a question, sure, put it on this chat and we'll uh, ask the, our presenters if they can answer that. So each one has about a little less than 10 minutes. So without further delay again, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to present for us. And let me start with doc Dr. Dan Bissell from Business and Public Administration. Uh, she's a professor in the Public Policy and Administration Department. Hello everyone, my name is Dan Bees Hall. I'm an assistant professor at the PPA department here at the CSUB. It's such an honor for me to be here and share my research findings. And I'll be more than happy if after this talk, if some of you become more interested in doing research in public administration, that will be really great. The title of the talk is The Joyful Word of Research in Public Administration. Before I start, it's probably a good idea to talk about what is public administration. And this is actually the question that I ask my student whenever I start uh, the new semester. Now, I'd like to ask this question to you as well, but given the limited time, I will just offer my own answer. But please feel free to think about your own answer in your, um, in your mind as you listen to this talk. When someone asks me what public administration is, I will probably say it's everywhere. When you think about it, um, when you drive, you will need a driver's license, right? And where do you go to get that? DMV, which is a government organization. What about the COVID and the pandemic situation? Who's in charge of distributing the free vaccine and who's in charge of deciding whether or not to have mask mandates? Again, it's the government and public administration. The same goes with the water. When you drink water, you need to pay for deposit, 
the CRB program, which is the state of California government is in charge of. The same goes for the war and emergency situation. The government, public administration is in charge of protecting the lives of the people in this country. When you go to national park for vacation, it's also the government's job to protect and manage the environment. Public administration is everywhere and it's about everything. And why am I talking about this? Because public administration is everywhere and everything. The research in public administration is, is also can be about everything and it can be everywhere. Where and how do I get research ideas? So I understand that this workshop is for students who are interested in doing or pursuing research career. So I put this slide here. I would say there are three main ways. So the first one is really reflecting on your own experience. When you go to national park, you might be uh, curious about some part of the management of the uh, national park. Or uh, when you drink water, you might have some question about the CRB program. And that can be the starting point of your research. Your own experience, it's a great start, but it's not enough. You also need to study the previous research findings, and sometimes you also need to engage with practitioners who are actually working in the field so that you can gain more um, insight. All right, then what about my own research agenda? So let me give you an example with my own research. For me and my research, I am interested in racial inequality in the state of Minnesota. This is the state of Minnesota, and this is where I used to live before coming to Bakersfield, and this is where I got my doctoral degree. So I and my research team were based in Minnesota, and that's why we were interested in Minnesota. So the state of Minnesota is well known for a great place to live in terms of employment, income, and home ownership when you look at the white resident. But the same state is one of the worst states in the country in terms of employment, income, home ownership, when you look at the people of color population. Sad, but interesting, right? And then with the further research, I and my research team discovered that minority entrepreneurs and minority owned businesses were doing well. They were growing faster than their white uh, counterparts. And if you have a family member who is a minority entrepreneur, it's more likely that you will get more income, you will be in a better living position. So in the long term, the racial income gap is likely to be reserved a little bit. So when you combine these two, you can kind of see that, okay, so if we help minority entrepreneurs more effectively, that will probably help solving the racial inequality issue in Minnesota. So this was the starting point of our research. Again, we were using our own experience and the previous research findings, and now it was time for us to talk with practitioners. So with more research, we discovered that the policy in the state of Minnesota were actually not really good for minority people. And there was a collaboration of nonprofit organizations who were helping minority entrepreneurs. Uh, their mission was support minority entrepreneurs and minority owned businesses, and thereby reducing the racial wealth and income disparities in Minnesota. So we decided to work with these practitioners so that we can have more insight about this problem and continue our research. And of course, there are a lot of different steps to be taken in order to be more specific about your research question and pursue the research. I'm gonna skip this part because again, the purpose is just to show you the process of the doing research in the field of public administration, as opposed to um, introducing my own research context. That was the broader topic that I had in my mind with my research. And for research design, we decided to do the longitudinal qualitative process case, a process oriented case study for five years, meaning we were interested in the process of this collaboration, what they are working on, how they are working together. And we were going to look at the qualitative data, meaning we were going to use the archiver documents, interviews, participant observations that give us context rather than looking at numbers and statistical data. Okay, then now you understand that we had a lot of data and what kind of data that we use. Then you may ask, 
what do you do with the data? So I'm going to show you some visual images of what we did in data analysis. Again, I'm not going to go into the detail because the purpose is not to introduce my own research topic, but to introduce and talk about the research process in general in the field of public administration. So here are some images. When we have interview data, we usually transcribe it on the uh, software. And the one that we use was Tammy. And then we will do some coding and using the software called NVivo. So these are some images that we um, actually did. We also summarize a lot of interviews because we obviously have a lot so that we can um, understand the flow of the interview easily. We also gathered longitudinal organizational profiles of the Synergy collaboration members. And based on those um, data, we made a case narrative or a story with a timeline so that we can have a better understanding of the process of what they are working and how they are working. So this was the, um, the process of data analysis in our research. Then the next question would be, how do you present the finding? Okay, so I see that you had a lot of data and you went through some steps for data analysis. And what about the findings? Well, sometimes we made a timeline so that we can share this with a broader audience at conferences or uh, in classes. We also share the visualized version of the coding structure so that our audience can better understand what we did with the initial data and our interpretation. Sometimes we identify some actions or some concepts out of the data, and this is one of the example. And sometimes we made a table or chart that shows the uh, history of this case and data analysis over five years. You see the timeline here, right? And again, this looks complicated and I'm, I'm not gonna go into details, but this is just to show you that how sometimes we use visualization to show the summary of our data and share the findings. So this is all part of the process. How do you present the finding? Okay, so I see that you had a lot of data and you went through some steps for data analysis. And what about the findings? Well, sometimes we made a timeline so that we can share this with a broader audience at conferences or uh, in classes. We also share the visualized version of the coding structure that our audience can better understand what we did with the initial data and our interpretation. Sometimes we identify some actions or some concepts out of the data, and this is one of the example. And sometimes we made a table or chart that shows the uh, history of this case and data analysis over five years. You see the timeline here, right? And again, this looks complicated and I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but this is just to show you that how sometimes we use visualization to show the summary of our data and share the findings. This is all part of the process. This was some visualization effort of our findings. Then the next question would be, what do you do with the findings? Well, after taking a lot of efforts, putting a lot of efforts in this process, we will have findings that we would like to share with the broader audience, right? The scholars and colleagues and practitioners, and of course, with our students. What we do is we publish articles and reports so that more people can read our research. We attend conferences and exchange ideas to gain more insights and also talk about our own research findings and get feedback. With the finding, we also try to help practitioners. So in this case, we were trying to help those people who were helping minority entrepreneurs. This is actually my team members and I was the one who was taking this picture. We had this workshop where we were share our findings and help them better understand the racial inequality issue in Minnesota and how they can more effectively help minority entrepreneurs. Lastly, but it's also important, we also use the research finding to teach students in the class and also guide them to the joyful world of research in public administration when they are interested. So I've been talking about the research area in public administration, how I get research idea, and then how I process my data and what I do with the findings. 
I know there is a lot missing because of the time limit, but I'll be happy to answer any question if you're interested in my research or um, anything about public administration research. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was terrific. I would like everyone to see that a research question can come from your personal interest. And I hope you all got to see the wonderful passion, uh, the passion to change the world, to make things different for inequitable things in the world. And the most important thing that you saw here is that, you know, making a difference, right? And then the other thing is that it's not easy work. So I, I'm really glad that you presented the qualitative aspects of it. And this takes time. It's a commitment. And that's why you have to follow your passion. You know, thank you for a wonderful introduction. Thank you, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Let me introduce Dr. Miriam Parada now, who is from the Arts and Humanities School of Arts and Humanities. And she's a professor in the modern languages and literature, Spanish, so take it away. Thank you, that was a great first presentation. So I'm uh, Miriam Parada, and I'm an associate professor of Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures over here in the Arts and Humanities side of uh, the campus. It says Associate Professor of Spanish, but as Dr. Vega alluded to, it, our fields are so diverse, right? We, we can call Spanish a discipline, but within Spanish, right, there's so many sub-disciplines and within those sub-disciplines, further divisions. My work is in the field of sociolinguistics and maybe a little bit less traditional to the humanities than some of my colleagues who engage in literary analysis. My work is, I would say, much more interdisciplinary, straddles sort of the social sciences and the humanities. Given that language use, language acquisition is like the quintessential human activity, so it intersects with so many other things that we engage in in life. There's a lot of places to look for language use. This is a little image that I had a chuckle with recently with my students. It says, prohibited to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> Thank you. And what I love about research and, and just being in, being in academia and this chosen profession is that we're always asking questions and that, that's, that's what research is all about is that questioning, questioning, questioning. So that's our approach with research. There's always more questions to, to be asked and to explore. And I will be just kind of, it was really hard for me to just focus on one project. So I just wanted to give you kind of a sense of some of the research projects I've been engaging in over the last few years. And I'll sort of go backwards. I'll show you some of my data and then that can give us some insight into how it was collected, what the methods were in getting to that data. And just to give you a sense too of some of the questions that are asked in my field of sociolinguistics is focused on Spanish. Sometimes my students will say, well, I don't really know what's a good research question or, or it seems like everything's been done, but really there's an infinite number of questions and, and ways to go with research. I completed my, my doctorate in Chicago and here you see a picture of my little boys who are now teenager and preteen. And to <laughs> circle back to, the, to our first speaker's point, the questions arise from all sorts of places. I know that just raising children has brought up so many questions for me and research ideas, just observing their, their language use and language acquisition has fueled my research at times. Even just things as simple as going to the supermarket or <laughs> museums or traveling, you know, there's things that stick out to you and that inspire you and raise questions for you that you can then explore in your research. I don't know if students here know, but th there is social media <laughs> for academics, specific networks that we use to share or, and exchange our research. Google Scholar, I think you, you're probably familiar with that as, a, as an okay starting point for looking for resources. Of course, it's not as robust as the uh, databases in the library that you want to get to, but we create profiles here with our research and you can kind of see how much your articles have been cited and sort of their gauge their impact. And I can get alerts from when other academics post their articles and it helps me stay engaged. There's also academia where you can post your articles for people to not only read the abstract, but they can download them. That's a good tool. And for you grad students who are already engaging in not only research, but in publications, co-authored publications with your mentors, you could go ahead and create a profile there and begin to have an online presence as a scholar. So the steps to conducting research in the field of sociolinguistics, similar to many other fields where we start sort of doing some research on, on, on the literature, on the topic, you sort of have a vague question, right? And, and a topic you're interested in, and you start to read some literature on that in order to develop more concrete formal research questions from that review. Then this is probably the step that takes the most time, <laughs> interestingly enough, is the study design, right? You really want to have a well design study so that then you don't run into problems later and have to go back and correct it and you could lose a lot of time that way. So a very strong study design is important. Then you engage in your data collection, which depending on what the question is can be shorter or lengthy. 
uh, whether it's quantitative data or qualitative data, as we saw in the last presentation, right? There are different time constraints. Then we analyze that data and we work on reporting those results at conferences and, and publications. And we come up with conclusions which are different than results. These are really like the implications of our, of, of our results. What importance do they have in, in the field or, or for practitioners, right? Uh, what, what are the theoretical applications, but what are the practical applications of, of the research? And then always looking uh, forward to next steps, right? What, how can I further study? You, you're giving ideas not only for what other folks can do with this topic, but what you intend to do as a next step. So I said my research is very interdisciplinary. I look at language acquisition, particularly um, acquisition of heritage languages. So most of our students here at CCB, a large number of them, right, are heritage speakers of Spanish. They acquired Spanish as a minority language. Their Spanish can look different from that of their parents, right, who were raised in a, in a monolingual environment. I look at how, how their Spanish is distinct from that of their parents and from the, the Spanish acquired by second language learners, that was, you know, adult second language learners. I'm also interested just in language, just in sociolinguistics, right? What we look at is the intersections between, between language and society and how language impacts society and then the other way around, right? My research is in a number of different areas, but I have looked a lot at this idea of language shift. We have, there's a well-established pattern that there's a, a shift to English, a pretty quick shift from from the minority language to English here in the US, right, across three generations. So the grandchildren of immigrants generally are English dominant or English monolingual. So that's pretty well established, but there's a lot of work to be done and, and that has been done already and seeing what factors condition that shift, right? What factors accelerate it, what, what factors kind of put the brakes on it and, and how that looks at it from a more detailed perspective. So I don't want to get into too many details with that, but my dissertation work looked at the community of Chilean Swedes, so Chile, the Chilean diaspora in Sweden, minority Spanish speakers. And I was interested in looking at specifically the lexicon and how that varied across generations, not only in how many words the speakers knew, but what kinds of words they knew and how they were organized cognitively. There were some cognitive linguistic aspects to my study and cultural aspects, right? So there's some Getting back to the qualitative, quantitative, there was like quantitative aspects and then also some qualitative analysis in looking at how their mental lexicons were organized because of, or due to env environmental factors, right? Like the cultural environments in which they were raised. Uh, in that same study, I also looked at dialect contact and the contact that the Chilean Spanish speakers in, Swede, in Sweden were having with uh, Spanish, peninsular Spanish speakers in Spain that frequently traveled to Spain and I looked at how that contact was affecting their Spanish. I'll look at maybe one or two ideas and then I know I need to be finishing up here. Another question that I've explored, so I showed you that graph of like from first, second, third generation, but I was very interested in looking more micro at the uh, second generation. So what was going on in the second generation? Were there specific factors that either hindered or helped yeah, language maintenance? And I was interested in this variable of birth order. We know that birth order has been studied in a lot of different areas and been shown to be an important factor, but I wondered if it was an important factor for language development as well. And I did find that there was a clear advantage for the firstborn children in, in language maintenance and there are stronger levels of Spanish language maintenance among the firstborn. Of course, this is because they had greater input from their parents as the firstborn children and less English brought into the home from older siblings. And then I also found this birth order to be significant in the names that the parents gave their children by birth order. So the older children tended to have highly ethnic names, right, versus their younger siblings. And I have sort of theorized on the, the implications this has for language development and language use as well and identity. On the concept of Latinidad, we know that we can talk about um, Latinos in the U.S., but there are reg regionally important differences, right? important differences by origin. And so I looked at this in terms of naming and how names might differ between um, the Latino population in Chicago versus LA, what these um, naming patterns can reveal about cultural and linguistic assimilation and the values and aspirations that parents have for their children. And a lot of this data was based on um, interviews that I conducted, but also like, like surveys, but then also looking at like the social security administration baby naming data. So sometimes there are databases publicly available that can be for researchers. A lot of my work is multi-method, uh, mixed methods, right? So quantitative, qualitative, and I, and I look at different data sources. I also, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, you're inspired in different, every every area you go in your life. So even just looking at the news, you know, I, I came to be very interested in how 
Spanish origin names, personal names and place names were presented in, in, the, in English language news. And in baseball, right, this engagement of the public with, with Spanish names, their diacritic markings, and sort of the impact that that, that that had on the public's understandings of Spanish. I'm happy to, to meet with any students who would like to know more about my research, but I guess let me just go here to, to the end to sort of finish off as our first speaker did in reiterating the importance of research, not only to answer just theoretically interesting questions, but also to for practical application, right? And a lot of my work is of more theoretical interest, but it's also there are also some clear applications for pedagogical practices in how language instruction should look for the different types of speakers that there are, right? Heritage learners or second language learners. And how to, in this case, you know, this book that I'm highlighting here, pedagogical practices for heritage learners and, and building heritage language programs, what different students with different language profiles with what how their needs differ, right? Both are important for further knowledge and a strong research project will have both theoretical and practical importance. That's it for today. Please feel free to contact me. Uh, it's been incredibly rewarding to collaborate with my students on, on, on different research projects. And um, if you're interested in the, in the Spanish master's program, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Parada. That's very interesting research, you know, I have to say. I, I will be looking up your work since I have done a little bit on the language shift, you know, from Spanish to English. So thank you again. I think what I got is that uh, your curiosity about your own children, about culture, and how you brought all of that into, into the planning stage, which was the design. And in terms, it's not just planning, but you have to be prepared. So a lot of the numbers that you saw on the screen, that has taken a lot of preparation, a lot of analysis. Uh, but the nice thing is that you answer difficult questions that you come to understand, right? Differences among groups and even how they name their children, which is very interesting. And in the process of doing so, understanding culture. And there comes this joy in understanding, right? So it's terrific. I thought you, your presentation was amazing. Typically, I thought of uh, Spanish writing a Don Quixote or something like that. But if it's something like that, you know, it takes a lot of preparation. But you can see that uh, social linguistics, you can apply numbers and everything, and that's terrific. So please uh, approach Dr. Parada if you're interested in the Spanish program or even the French program. Right? French minor, and there are so, there's you can also declare a special major in French. In French, so. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So then next, let me introduce Dr. Serena Roberts from the School of Social Science and Education. She's a professor in the Advanced Educational Studies, a special education emphasis. And I uh, apologize because she had asked me if she needed a PowerPoint, but I said, oh, no, you know, you can just, uh, uh, you know, just uh, present. And so she's going to tell us about her research. And, and uh, thank you so much for agreeing to, to present to us. Okay, go. Hi, and welcome. I am Serena Roberts, as Dr. Vega said, and I am an assistant professor in special education program in the Advanced Educational Studies Department that is in the social sciences and education. And the social sciences is pretty big, and I guess I'm representing that, right? But I'm speaking mainly to education and then just what you what's typical and what you can expect in special education. I want to start with sharing a little bit about my journey. So I'm going to talk a little about my journey and how it brought me to my research and being here, right? And then I also want to um, give you some tidbits about the types and nature of research that you can do in the field of education, but particularly in special education. And my hope is that all of us inspire you to be researchers or jump in on a research project or learn further about research. So to start, I did not expect to be a professor. And I also did, did not expect to get a PhD, a master's or anything like that, right? I just wanted to teach. I was a teacher. That's what I did. And I taught um, third, fourth, and fifth graders in special education. I started to come across a lot of tension or problems, right? And some of those problems were as simple as I cannot, I cannot believe that I have a student who is an English language learner who does not appear to have any type of disability whatsoever. From that point, I started to develop an interest in reading and language development. Just from in my practice came some interests that I had, things that I experienced in my workplace and in my everyday life kind of guided me to my research agenda. And then my research agenda has evolved from that, right? So I started and I thought, gosh, I have 
I work in a predominantly Title I um, English language learner population, and I have all of these students that speak Spanish and we're not able to meet their needs. And how do I work with them to support them so that either they don't end up in a special education placement or I help them to support them in terms of their reading and language development. I became very interested in vocabulary. If any of you are scared of this, I said, I remember saying to my dad, oh, geez, I cannot write. <laughs> so therefore I don't want to do research. I can't write. I can't do anything really because I don't know how to write as well as maybe some of these people have published. And what I learned, it's really not about how well you write. It's kind of about how good your ideas are and what you bring to the table with those and how you can develop a problem because there's always support that you can get for those other things. I did go and I did get my master's and go on to get my PhD. And when I got my PhD, I worked on a project and that project led me to my dissertation. And so that project, we worked with middle school students, four different school districts, several different schools. And it was designed to help these middle school students who at the time we considered having very low reading and language development skills and maybe at risk for academic failure or students who had an actual IEP or disability, an individualized education plan. And so with that, uh, we focused on history because that was an area where, geez, there is a lot of content that they have to cover in history that they're not able to really grasp. And the reason why they can't grasp the, the content is because first you have to be able to read the textbook, right? You have to be able to do that part and digest it and comprehend it to even understand the rest. So we had three components to this research that we did with them. And it was, can we teach them history through teaching these strategies and maintain their same levels of understanding of the history content or increase them, as well as work on these things that they need, right? Which is the reading and language development and vocabulary development. So the three components were decoding strategies using a best strategy. And then we also used a vocabulary development piece. And so, you know, I loved that piece. <laughs> and then we also had a reading comprehension piece, what we consider multi-component intervention, those three aspects to it that we developed over time throughout the course of a year, providing one at a time and then introducing the next and the next starting with the decoding, introducing vocabulary, and then later introducing reading comprehension. It's really important that part because we learned from that, like, oh, geez, you want to see each individual thing, how it operates on its own or once added to the next thing. If you do them all at the same time, you don't know which one is the most effective. That is really one of the strategies we used in how we designed our study. My aspect of the study, as you probably guessed from my intro, was the vocabulary. But I'm also interested in the well-being, the self-concept of students. I studied both the vocabulary and self-concept of students. Do they think that they are understanding or getting the vocabulary? Do they feel confident in their abilities to produce the language, to understand the words, to read something and be able to dissect individual vocabulary and then also to look at it as a whole. It's like, what does it mean in the context? So that's what I studied for my dissertation and what I wrote my dissertation on. But I wanna point out that that is a very practicum, practical practitioner-based type of research. And really, special education is all about that. It's very practical based, but education as a whole, so those of you who aren't maybe interested in just special education, education as a whole does look at what our other, my other two colleagues spoke about, right? Qualitative research and quantitative. Qualitative piece, in case you're wondering, is the part where you're thinking, okay, well, how is this occurring? Why is this occurring? So you think of those W's that you learned in school, like why is it that this problem is occurring in schools? How come 
students who are of color are dropping out at higher rates than other students. So you might be thinking of something like that. And that is more of a qualitative nature. And sometimes we get at that through educational structures. Why are these systems in place? How do these systems work to suppress some students or to keep some behind and then improve or elevate others through gate specialized program that not everybody has access to. So that's kind of what you can get at, but you can also get at the quantitative, which is the type of research I was doing, which is very much the, okay, I have a problem that I'm seeing. How do I address it? What was the problem in my example of my research that I partook in? Well, it was really the, gosh, they cannot read the textbook or any of the texts, and they're having a difficult time with reading comprehension to even understand history in content. How did we address that problem? We implemented an intervention. What's an intervention? That is a set of strategies or something that you're putting in place to improve or change something that currently exists. So that's very much the type of research that special educators do. What you'll find is that we center around, especially if you're looking at a master's, two different kinds of research to give you an idea of what most or the bulk that you'll see in journals or that you might want to do. And one is single case design. In a single case design, we have a small group a subset of students or individuals, and right, all these things occur usually in classroom settings. In that single case design, we might have, let's say, three children or students with autism, and those three students or children with autism, we want to stop them or decrease the number of outbursts that they're having during the math session, which might be what a 30 minute math session. Then it is okay. We have that small group of three, that's what make it, makes it a single case design. And we do what we call baseline. We see where are they currently at with nothing added to what they're doing. Then we move from baseline to, okay, I'm going to provide an intervention or a strategy. In this case, let's say it is social stories where you're going to prompt them and prime them in advance with a story that tells them about what's going to happen next in their day and preparing them for that and going through the steps through that story, then they can be successful in doing it. That would look like, okay, well, you're going to have math next and during the math time and it details in story fashion and format and it's practiced and discussed, or it could be video modeling where there's a video of what the behavior should look like. The hope is that they would take on that behavior and that maybe that having that in place each time before the math would decrease their outburst because now they see a model of what the behavior should be. So with that in place, that's the treatment or the condition. And then you take it away, right? In the single case design, you say, okay, now that it's gone, has it increased again? Has it maintained? What's happening? What's occurring? And that's how we can kind of adjust for that. It's a similar thing with action research, right? So action research is, I see a problem in my classroom. I'm going to research the problem. Then I'm gonna take action on it and see what can I do? Once I do that, how well did it go? Did it work out? Do I need to make adjustments? And so that's very practitioner based. Those are the two that you'll probably be most likely to do if you go into a master's program in special education. Lastly, I wanna end with, whoa, what if you surpass that? What if you have dreams of getting a doctorate? You have a dream of getting a doctorate. You could do probably single case design. That's very popular in the type of research that we do and probably the most used single case design, the one I spoke of before with a smaller number of students. But you might do quasi-experimental design, which was what I did in my dissertation. Quasi-experimental design is, okay, well, I have this classroom. They're going to receive the intervention. That would be like the, the reading strategy. Or these sets of classrooms will receive the intervention, the reading strategies. The other one can't receive nothing. That would be unethical. The other one can't receive nothing because 
that doesn't really make sense in practical terms. They're learning something, right, during that history time. So they're just receiving what we consider business as usual. You can't really assign like, I'm gonna take this student and place them in this group and that one and that because they have their own classes. So what you're really doing is it's non-random because you can't randomly distribute and assign them to different categories or groups. They just sit in the group that they're in and you assess whether the ones that receive the intervention do better than the ones that receive business as usual or whatever is currently existing in the class. That would be a quasi-experimental design, which also is done at um, a lot in dissertations. The other that I'll um, end with is the survey research. I like to use when I'm thinking of examining perceptions, opinions, belief systems, just what are the feelings of administrators, special educators, students. If you have a question like that, where what you're getting at is how do they perceive inclusion or how do they perceive co-teaching strategies? Then you might be looking at something that's survey research where you are giving out a survey and trying to figure out whether they have different perceptions, opinions, belief systems, and what the nature of those are of a collective group. Thank you so much. What I like about your presentation is that you always have to ask the question and not worry about the method because there will be a method. What's interesting about special education is that they deal with vulnerable populations and doing research with vulnerable population is kind of difficult as a practitioner because you'll be working out in the field and you, you're seeing this and how the interest the doctor Roberts mentioned that being a teacher, you know, she saw all of these things and that was her lab, you know, her classroom. Always look within you know, what brings your curiosity to the forefront and how you can execute on that curiosity. There's nothing more satisfying than looking at your findings and that you can make a difference. Feeling so good about that. Thank you so much for your presentation. We've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. So let me introduce our next presenter, Dr. William Kerr, who is in the natural sciences mathematics and engineering. I always consider that very difficult work, <laughs> but you know, he's going to tell us about his work and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Krug, again for presenting to us. Thank you uh, for introducing me and inviting me to speak before this uh, workshop. I'm uh, an associate professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. I am also the graduate program director uh, there. So if you're interested in doing a master's in geology, come talk to me. Um, but I think today I'm going to actually talk about doing research sort of from a perspective as someone that has did research at both the undergraduate level as a senior thesis. I've done a master's program, a PhD, postdoc, NSF sponsored research, all kinds of sort of different levels of, of research and how we actually go about doing that with the idea of approaching people to work with. So collaborating on topics as a, as a student, that's really important when you're looking for uh, uh, potential advisors. Um, and so give that as a perspective as not only as someone that has conducted that research, but then also someone that's looking for students to work with. Hopefully it'll be useful for you uh, in the end. In our field, we kind of combine all the different sciences. We're sort of the applied realm of biology, chemistry, uh, physics. Um, all of that goes into looking at, at applications in earth science and how we actually apply it to the earth. I personally work on tectonics, so the growth and destruction of mountain ranges through erosion, uh, so earth surface processes. Uh, and I've been interested in that in a long time, and I actually got really interested in that as an undergraduate student. But I never really was sure I wanted to go through the whole route of going to a, a, becoming a professor, so going through all the way through the PhD. I knew I was interested in research and, and working in, in their sciences. So I knew I wanted to go do a graduate program because it, it definitely opens up doors for, for getting employment, both advancing from uh, where you're at, maybe as an entry-level position. If you had an undergraduate degree, you can advance up the chain if you have a master's that makes it much more feasible. But a research-focused thesis or graduate program is actually really useful when you want to go do a job that has a research component with it. In the geological sciences, some working with the USGS is one of those types of places where you really kind of need some research background somehow. So the, the, the why do I want to do research? One is to, maybe that's the field that I, I want to be working in. That's the job that I see myself uh, doing or just having broader opportunities for uh, employment in the future. And you never know where things are going to go. 
when I started, I had no idea what I was doing and I didn't know exactly how to go about applying to graduate programs. I did things late. I applied to some places I knew I wanted to go. So I was looking at different schools. Uh, I didn't, wasn't getting into them. I made the very lucky decision of going and talking to my, uh, one of my advisors uh, uh, in the, worked in an area that I was actually had some interest in. Um, I went and talked to him and he sort of sat me down and said, okay, you need to apply to these different schools on time at a certain time. Um, you need to first get in touch with a, an advisor there. I have a couple of people I can recommend that you might want to look at and send an email to, introduce yourself, send a CV, say, I've been working on this, get the ball rolling that way. Uh, and that, that was tremendous help. Um, I had no idea that I need to do that. It's very different from applying to undergrad. When I did that, I met my future advisor um, and really saw that we had interests in common. That allowed me to feel more comfortable going to work with him in on, on a master's project. A lot of people don't know how you actually go about getting a research topic. Um, there's many different ways that that can happen. In geology and in many of the sciences, people have funding that they need to be sort of working on a specific uh, or focused area, but they may not have specific topics for students to work on directly, but they have a general idea of what something that you might work on. Um, and so when talking to potential advisors, they often have sort of a research focus. So you want to line up with that interest. When you start talking to them, you can start narrowing things down. You start generally broad and work down to a more specific topic in consultation with an advisor and consultation with other people on that you may put together on a thesis committee to sort of design a project that fits your research interest and fits your, the interests of your advisor because uh, they're putting a lot of time into this as well. So when you do that, you can uh, come up with a research plan. Often it involves, the very first part is, is doing a literature review, often initially directed by uh, an advisor. They'll give you some papers to start with. And then you kind of go from there as you start finding more material, researching different aspects, coming up with your own questions, starting to, to really uh, design this. Uh, and then once you get that, uh, idea of your research uh, kind of going and, and moving forward, um, you end up putting together a proposal um, that you'll, in most cases, will present and, and, and defend that proposal to your committee. But in many cases, you don't necessarily need to stop there with the, with the proposal. You can actually start looking for funding um, at the, for grad students. So not that this is often separate from what your advisor may have available or, or, or that you can work with them on. Um, these are things like, the student research scholar CSB, that's a good, a good a small amount of funding for students to work with. Um, other national societies, so in, in geology, we have the Geological Society of America, they have graduate student grants. I encourage all my students to actually write grants for that. They're usually short two to five page uh, proposals that actually get feedback from external uh, professionals um, that, that review those grants, can give you feedback, uh, and it actually helps solidify your thinking on, on that project. And it may get you some money and something that you can put on your CV. Uh, so it's very useful in that, in that respect. And then once you get that project signed off, you do the fun part, which is actually conducting the research. In geology, we often have two different aspects. One is often a, a field work. Um, so you get to go out into the field. That's one of the reasons I am a geologist. I love to go outdoors. I've been to Argentina, Alaska, all over the U.S. Uh, doing geology uh, and, and in Europe as well. It, it's great to, to go out in the field to collect samples, to map, to take measurements using different pieces of equipment. It's really rewarding work. Um, you bring those samples back and you actually perform analyses in the lab. So actually getting familiarity with uh, different pieces of lab equipment that you may end up using in the future, uh, future employment in industry or in academia. So you get to, to use pretty modern, fancy pieces of equipment um, that, that, are, that are pretty exciting to do as well. But it's not just field work in geology, we also do lab work and work with computers doing geophysics uh, type, type problems uh, is also uh, a really rewarding part. So once you're sort of conducting that, uh, that analysis, you, you're, you're sort of reviewing the data, looking at your results and making interpretations on them, you then have to kind of sit down and put, put all of that together in writing up the thesis, and potentially putting that publication together to go out and, and for submission to a journal uh, and hopefully be published. Um, and, and as you progress in different levels, then that 
that tends to be more of the focus is, is the presentation or as a publication, but it's something that you can do at any level. Um, even as an undergrad, you can, you can work to do research and, and submit that with usually with an advisor for publication. But also don't miss the opportunity for presenting your results, both locally at, at things like the student research scholars uh, competitions, as well as uh, in local and national and even international conferences. Uh, there's opportunities there for you to present your work, your research. Um, there's uh, plenty of opportunities to get funding to go do that. I encourage everyone to take advantage of those opportunities. That's just kind of my experience was I got to do all this at, at many different levels, go see lots of really cool, interesting places. It does take a lot of work, so you want to make sure that it's something that interests you. Um, and if you're not sure about that, go talk to an advisor. We often have small projects that we might be able to put you on to at least get a taste for what it involves. You may like it and you may decide, okay, that's something for me. And then you can sort of talk with them to, to set something up. I'm happy to answer any questions and uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions. I really love that you've been all over the world. And uh, I think you described that the research is also a professionalizing experience. You know, it's going to create a record for you and those here that you can apply even uh, as a professor in the future or even in your work setting. And you've been exposed to the latest technology, right? I mean, things that Definitely. would be very expensive that you know, are there. And then the nice thing about the natural sciences, what is called also STEM fields, is that there is more money for support too. Thank you so much, Dr. Kruger. And like he said, approach us. You know, you have to come and talk to the professors and you'll be surprised. It's never too late. We're happy to support you in any way that we can. And it's a process. You know, you notice that it's a slow process, but you know, don't be patient. You're here for the long run to learn. And uh, I just love the passion of all of you, you know, you, but again, it's your research. This is what you do every day, right? So, and this is what our students can look into the future. A life of passion, doing what you love and contributing. Thank you so much. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. So let me just introduce our last speaker. Dr. He, are you uh, ready to give us a little background? Thank sure. you. Sure, sure, absolutely. Hi, thank you for inviting me. I'm Dr. Heidi He, I'm from the nursing department. What I'm going to talk about is the research practice process and perspective in nursing specifically. At CSUB, the graduate nursing program that we have is a nurse practitioner program. So obviously, nurse practitioner are clinicians. We prepare our students to become uh, healthcare providers, to become clinicians. I think it's important to talk about what is a nurse practitioner before we talk about research uh, practice in nursing or specifically uh, as nurse practitioners. I think many of you probably already know what is a nurse practitioner, but I think uh, just to refresh everybody's memory, practitioners are already registered nurses. And uh, then, except we had additional uh, education and training, we have expanded scope of practice. So our scope of practice actually is expand into functions normally reserved for physicians only, such as order and interpreting uh, diagnostic testings, diagnosis, and initiate and manage treatment plans, including prescribing medications up to schedule two substance. That being said, AB 890 uh, just into effect. And uh, so nurse practitioners in California with three years of experience able to function independently. So we have a full practice authority. You can see there's a lot of responsibilities. Uh, so we prepare our students to be at that level. To be licensed to practice in California, uh, they must pass a national certification exam, and then, then um, out, uh, graduate from a credit uh, NP program, of course, before they can practice in California. Then I'm going to talk about the process. The process, basically, evidence-based clinical practice is a scholarship. I mean, reality is every patient encounter is a scientific process uh, because the patient obviously coming with a problem. Otherwise, why are they coming to see me? There's something they want me to do, right? So if I'm looking at an individual level, for example, my specialty is phonology and critical care, and uh, then my patient say, for example, uh, have a diagnosis of asthma. Why is this patient keep having exacerbation? Ask question first. The format we ask, we want to know what's the patient population, you know, uh, what's the interest or what's the intervention that we're interested in. 
and then we'll compare uh, the interventions. Then we're looking for the outcomes. Ultimately, it's improving patient outcome. That's why we're here. That's why we're clinicians, uh, be it individual patient outcome or a population of patients right, or group of patients. Uh, when I listen to Dr. Roberts' presentation, and uh, I think the approach is very, very similar, and is the, you know, the population, the interventions, and uh, then we're looking for the outcomes. Then once we recognize that problem, and then, of course, we need to look, look for the best evidence. And then once we... Uh, uh, do a lit review. What's out there? What is the current recommendations? What's the current, uh, you know, research? But on the other hand, we also need to understand the level of evidence. Not all the evidence are weighted equally. You can look at the evidence that is meta-analysis of all the relevant random control trials, right? Or you can look at the expert opinion. So which one weighted higher and versus lower? Obviously, expert opinion will be the lowest. What's specific for nursing is the integration of all the evidence, including clinicians' uh, expertise, my experience as a clinician, and then patients' preference and their value in making a medical uh, decisions. I can write all I want. I can make all the recommendations, and I'm telling them, you know, take your inhalers, this is maintenance inhaler, this is a rescue inhaler. And guess what? Patient don't taking it. It's not making any difference. The patient's not going to be get better on its own. Then I need to find out why are they not taking it? Is that because they can't afford it? They don't know how to do it. And you have no idea how often that when patient comes back, and uh, patient never got the prescription because either the insurance doesn't cover it, it's not on their formula, and so oh, I didn't get it. Things like that, we, we most definitely, as a clinician, we need to be very, very aware. And uh, then also, uh, I think the patient's uh, the preference. Then we need to work with the patient and including patient in the decision-making process. And unless we have the patient buying, the intervention is not going to work. Then of course, you evaluate the patient. When patient comes back, is that improving? If it's not improving, what needs to be changed? So that's the process. And that's each individual encounter. But as a research, you know, looking at a bigger population, a group of a population, that same process applies. For our program, because our focus is more uh, clinical focused, we only do small projects, like more group projects. But for the student, for the culminating exam, they need to write an original paper to address a unique question. And then uh, they need to perform comprehensive but focused lit review. They need to identify and describe the population appropriate intervention then to address that problem. We don't ask them to implement it because we understand how time consuming and that the result is to collect the result and analyze the result. But as the program advanced to the doctoral level, like DNP, and then obviously the, the requirement will elevate it too. Earlier, you might have seen that I said every nurse practitioners who need to practice in uh, California has to pass a national exam. So yes, our students has to have a proctored comprehensive exam. So hopefully to prepare them to uh, pass the national certification exam. So that's the, that's the process and that's the practice. And then, then I'm going to talk about a little bit about perspective. So perspective, we believe that, you know, healing is a science, but caring is an art. And my favorite you know, definition is always nurse practitioners have the offer the both of the best world. Tell my patients, oh, you get the best of the uh, both world. You have that uh, brain of the doctor and the heart of the nurse. And also what we need to understand is our patient lives in the real world and they don't live in a vacuum and everything affects patient outcome. 
earlier I'm listening to the speakers, like um, public health, public policy, what that most definitely affects patient outcome, affects uh, health equality and uh, health equity, and also affects that, as I said, patient outcome. And uh, then culturally, any information, any knowledge we learn because um, the cultural practice most definitely affects patient outcome also. Again, I think nursing is in a way that we encompass everything because we take care of human beings. Oh, one last thing. If we use this as a recruitment, if anyone wants to be a nurse practitioner, this is how you become a nurse practitioner. You have to be a registered nurse first. You have to have a bachelor degree in nursing first. For us, uh, for our program, we require a uh, student have two or three years of experience because that's extremely important. That brings that perspective and the patient care experience. Then of course, then you can apply. We in general have about 60 applicants for about 18 spots, uh, but you have to be a RN first. And I don't know uh, if anyone knows about um, the percentage of acceptance in our RM program. I think last year is about 400 applicants for about 60 spots. So that being said, it's nursing school become a very selective. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Dr. He. I'm, uh, I really love the sayings there that uh, healing is a science and caring is an art. And also nurses having a lot of heart and you know, you definitely do. I should let our audience know that there is in the future plans for a doctoral program in nursing. I'm crossing my fingers that that happens because we do need it. Just lovely how you integrated all of the different sciences, you know, I mean, we live in a holistic world. Uh, I'm just very hopeful that our students will join us and, you know, go on to our graduate programs and do research. It's just so much fun as you saw from our presentations. Um, I guess I have a question, just one question, since I don't see anyone. Uh, how can students approach you? I know uh, Dr. Krug mentioned that, you know, that, and you made it seem very easy, but I know sometimes it's difficult for students. So can you, like, uh, just each of you say, well, a student can just come to me, and this is what I look for in a student, or what could they say to you so that you'd be willing to help them? Dr. He, since you're already there, would you mind going first? I think, um, well, as always, uh, then uh, just uh, reach out so we understand. It's essentially, it's more assessment. For me, it's nursing process all over again. <laughs> I, I need to understand what do you want to do, you know, and what's your goal. And uh, then, uh, then uh, that's how we decided how to the best to, to help you. Uh, if it's, I don't know, if not, I'm not expert, and I can most definitely refer them to the, you know, the right direction. And that's what I love being a big part of uh, this, you know, campus forum. So I understand what everybody else is doing. Now I know if there's anyone interested in education, special ed, I just send it to Dr. Robert. You know, anybody wants to, uh, and you know, want to know a little bit more about cultural ling linguistic, uh, Dr. Parada, and uh, geology, of course, going to <laughs> Dr. Cruz, you know, so. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, so the, don't be afraid to approach professors because even if we don't have the expertise, right, we can always, we know someone. Thank you. How about you, Dr. Cruz, what would you say? Hmm? Yeah, I, I would agree that um, I can always uh, point people in the right direction if it's, if it's clear that maybe you're not interested in exactly what I do, but you're you you do have interest in doing research, I can I can point you in the direction of of colleagues that that do work in that area, um, whether here at CSUB or or, or elsewhere, um, and and I'm happy to do that. I'm looking mostly that people are are interested interested in uh, a, a general area that that overlaps with what I work on and what I'm interested in, because that's that's where the the most likely outcome is going to be positive. Um, and so you, you want that to, to be there. And a genuine interest, it's, it's, you, you want to make sure that that's, that that's clear. Um, and if, if you're unsure again, we can always put, put people on a small project to see how things go. Um, and, and that's a good way to get experience. 
Yeah, I love that. And you had mentioned that earlier, test the water, right? Because maybe you don't like it, but you don't know until you try it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. What Dr. Cruz had just reminded me. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, sometimes students, you know, research is interesting. So students naturally do want to engage in it. They, they, especially when you tell them about what you do, they, uh, I find that they, they, they also want to partake. But we all have different constraints in our lives, right? In, a diff in different phases of our lives. So I think that's a really good strategy is just maybe put them on a small part of your project so they can test the waters, they can see what their life allows. And if they find they can make space for more research, then, you know, they can be given a bigger role or, or start to, um, you know, design their own projects. But I, I guess I just, um, and I didn't know this either, like just until I began engaging in research as a graduate student, as a master's student, how much time it takes, you know, it's a huge time commitment. So there has to be room for it in your life. Um, yes, and baby steps. Yeah. Yes, by the thank, right. thank you so much, yes. I would say, because it, sometimes it is challenging to even think of like, okay, what do I say? But it's like maybe um, just an interest statement, like what you don't have to know what you want exactly your research question to be or what you're gonna study or, or your whole pathway. You just have to know what your personal interests are. Like I'm interested in this, that, and the other. And um, I would like to see if there's some project or some something I can do. A lot of projects that we all engage in here at the campus are, are easy ways to carve out a piece of research within that. Oftentimes, a lot of our projects are paired with our research. Um, so just things here on campus that you're interested in could turn into a research project for you or um, research that you publish with, um, with someone. And um, so I would say first start with just what are you interested in and then reach out with your interest and we can always connect you with with whoever that um, interest aligns with and also lastly just to know that um, even if right now you're not ready to do it but it's something in the future it's good to reach out now and just say that like I this is where I want to go and what I want to do because then you can be paired up with someone who can help you to get to that pathway if you're not currently ready. Marius, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah that's, that makes good sense. Uh, Dr. Sale, would you mind also saying a few words? Thank you, Dr. Robertson. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I will echo what others said already. So sometimes it takes some courage to reach out to professors, but that is the very important uh, first step. So I will just say student, um, they need to reach out first. And one tip from me would be, um, if possible, uh, be more specific in your email. So again, you don't have to know what's your research question, but we are not expecting that. It's just knowing what you are interested in, the general areas, and what you really want to talk about with a professor. So that will increase the chance of having more um, constructive conversation. Um, and that's what I did when I was reaching out to different professors and different graduate programs when I was looking for different doctoral programs. And then I recently got an email from a student, not from CSUV, and he said, I'm interested in your research. I want to work with you. But that was the end of the email. There was nothing like what he is interested in and what he would like to work with. So it was very difficult for me to answer that email. So be specific if possible. That would be my advice. Thank you. I, I would also say that maybe students who are taking your courses, right? That would be like a great connection because you already know the professor a little bit. So Elias took one of my courses and then he's doing the research now. And I was wondering if you are willing to share a little bit on how you went about it and how you said that you were brave and uh, the type of work that you do right now and briefly would you mind going into that a little bit yeah absolutely um i just want to first by uh thanking all of you and all you educators out there you guys are uh doing such extraordinary work and each one of you provides so much insight like dr vega said we're living in a collective experience and so it's very vital that we all uh, demonstrate that and push uh, society forward. So I want to thank you guys for that. I took Dr. Vega for social psychology and I study psychology with a minor in sociology. I'm really looking to get into the doctoral program, really envisioning myself being a professor and being an educator. And that was kind of the thing that prompted me forward to really 
highlight specific issues in my community. What I did was I tried to navigate myself through different areas. I knew that having this background in research was really going to help me out when it came to applying for the doctoral program. Social psychology is an extraordinary field, and it really encapsulates both sociology and psychology. And what better person to ask than Dr. Vega himself, right? And Dr. Vega was extraordinary in the social psychology class. I reached out to him via email And I told him, you know, if we could set up a meeting, I would like to talk to him about what's to come for my future and what I really want to do. He explained to me the different directions that I could go in. And we came into a a great uh, project that we're working on, which is food culture and Latinx and uh, Hispanic origins here in the Central Valley. We're really looking at the disparities between this medical approach, sociological and uh, psychological research, and it's very lacking. We were noticing that these health disparities link are linked to diabetes and heart disease. Why is this happening? And we're really just investigating the lack of contribution to this discipline. And we were really trying to highlight that. And I, I, let me just say that I didn't pay him, you know, and I, I'm surprised that he was here, but I'm glad that he came. He wants to go to a doctoral program and I'm very happy to support him. We're hoping that we can get a publication. So that's the other thing that the professors here, you know, if you, they share your interest, they will step up and help you, you know, because we have small classes and we're more than happy to help you, all of us. Thank you, Elias. Really appreciate your kind words today. Thank you so much. Have a terrific weekend. Uh, we're very grateful. I mean, you're giving so much to us. And, you know, just know that uh, the students are grateful too. Thank you so much.